Take your Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Tonight I'd like to open the word with you. And if I were to give this a topic or a title of what I have in my heart to share with you tonight, I would call it the red thread. You find him everywhere in the word. It has been sin consciousness plus condemnation that has robbed Christians in the past of their believing. It has robbed Christians in the past of their sense of worthiness before God. It has robbed Christians in the past of the joy of their sonship. We as believers just had not been taught and consequently and subsequently we did not know the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We did not know that we were more than conquerors through him who loved us and who gave himself for us. We did not know that we could do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We did not know that we were complete in Christ. We did not know that we were seated in the heavenlies now. People, we just did not know. For no one taught us. In Colossians chapter 1, in verse 13 we read, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, past tense. He hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us. The word translated in the Sanskrit is the word given us citizenship. He hath given us citizenship in the kingdom. The text reads in his kingdom, in God's kingdom, by the work of his dear son, Jesus Christ. Today, in our way ministry around the world, we be, as believers believe that we are in Christ and we act as it is true. He hath delivered us, past tense, from the power of darkness. And class, if we've been delivered, then we've been delivered. It's either the truth or it's a lie. Well, we believe it's the truth of God's word. That God in Christ Jesus hath delivered us from the power of darkness and that he has given us legal citizenship, sonship rights in that citizenship in his own kingdom, in God's kingdom by the work of his dear son. Man's basic need throughout the years as well as man's basic need at this particular moment is righteousness. Every human being who sincerely desires to make his or her life meaningful while here upon earth has an inner yearning, an inner desire, an inner gnawing in the innermost part of that being to want to be righteous. In Romans chapter 3, And in verse 20, we read, Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. That's God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But, but, verse 21, but in contrast, now, right now, not when you die, not someday maybe, but right now, beloved, now the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. 
The word manifested means clear. It is not hidden. It is beautifully in view, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 22, very carefully, even the righteousness of God. Whose righteousness? Righteousness of God, God's righteousness, which is by, and the word by is the Greek word dia means through, by way of what Jesus Christ did. The righteousness of God by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them who do one thing, what? Believe. The human mind can never comprehend it. But the spiritual man within can absorb it, utilize it, believe it, walk on it, and bring the greatness of this truth into manifestation. The righteousness of God. Well, how righteous is God? He's righteous. And all that righteousness of God, because of Christ Jesus and what he did for every born-again believer, that righteousness of God is unto all and upon all who do one thing, and that is believe. So when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you got the righteousness of God, which is that Christ in you, the hope of glory, that righteousness of God. And if man has that righteousness, why should he ever want to live below par? Why should he want to walk in negatives? Why in fears and worries and anxieties and frustrations? When we have what the Word of God says we have, when we are what the Word of God says we are, and it says that every believer, unto every believer because of the work of Jesus Christ, that individual believer receives the righteousness of God unto all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference. There is no difference between a man or a woman. There is no difference whether he's the governor of the state or the president or if he is the local individual delivering the milk. There is no difference whether it's a housewife or just a beautiful young lady. No difference. There is no difference whether it's white or black or red. No difference. But the great difference that he sets in here is the difference that had been between Jews and Gentiles. And now he says there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. For all, verse 23, have sinned and come short of the glory of what? God. All have sinned. Man, woman, black, white, make any difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So man's basic need, his basic need, people, is in the category of righteousness. And once men and women receive that Christ within, they have that righteousness of God. Isn't that a fantastic reality? You see, people, Jesus Christ has dealt with the root problem of man. Jesus Christ has dealt with sin. He has dealt with it. He dealt with it. And the root of man's unrighteousness is sin. Jesus Christ has dealt with the root, the sin problem. Therefore, today it's no longer a sin problem, but a sinner problem. Does the individual who has not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, does he want to believe? Does he want to receive the greatness of what God has made available in Christ Jesus? God dealt with it in Jesus Christ. It's over with. Now it's a question of the individual believing to receive what God made available in Christ Jesus. That's why it's a sinner problem. And when that individual believer 
confesses with his mouth the Lord Jesus, believe God raised him from the dead, he is saved. Romans 10, 9. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 9, 10. Or 10. Well, whatever it is, it's in Romans. <laughs> 10, 9, and 10, I guess. Someday I'm going to work the word just to see. Bless your heart. <laughs> Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Talking about Jesus Christ who was delivered, verse 25 of Romans 4, was delivered for our offenses. And the old text reads, for our sins. He was delivered for our sins. Ladies and gentlemen, it's so easy and so simple. All it requires is believing. He was delivered for our sins. Isaiah says in 53, I believe, that upon Jesus Christ he laid our iniquities, our sins. Let's say this teaching platform would re represent the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did. He laid upon him our sins. There they are, laid on him. Once they're on him, are they any longer upon me? Are they any longer upon you? No. Boy, what a fantastic thing the Word of God makes known to people who want to know the will of God. And ladies and gentlemen, you've got to come back to the Word of God if you want to know the will of God. You can't go by what some individual says or what the world says because we're not circumstance conditioned, we're not world conditioned, we are not conditioned by the traditions of men, we are word conditioned. You gotta come back to the word of God if you wanna know the will of God. And it says, Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. I think it's Coney Barenhausen who translate this. He was raised again when we were justified. Boy, what a reality. That's the truth of that verse. He was delivered, delivered for our sins, and he was raised again. God raised him when we were justified. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, therefore, whenever you read the word therefore in the word, you ask yourself why for. Because of that previous verse. Therefore, being justified, justified by faith, by the believing, by the action, by the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, being justified, we have peace. We receive the righteousness of God when we're born again. You could not receive the righteousness of God if God had not previously justified you. And he justified you in the death and in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he raised him from the dead, we were justified. We were made righteous. Therefore, being justified by faith, the faith of Jesus Christ, the believing of what he did, we have peace. Everybody seems to be looking for peace except the right place. You don't get peace by legislation. You get peace by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. You don't get peace by starting a war. You don't get peace any other place than from the author of peace who is God through Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen. You can't legislate peace, you believe for it, because it's available to every believer to be born again and not only to have the righteousness of God, but to be justified and to be at peace. Ladies and gentlemen, all these places where they sell those things you take at night to go to sleep, they'd all go out of business if we believed God's Word. You know why? We don't need a sedative to go to sleep at night. 
The reason you need a sedative is because you're all shook up inside. You haven't got peace. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got peace. We've got it. We do not have to bite our fingernails up to the second knuckles. We don't have to lay awake at night counting sheep. We can just believe in the shepherd and keep going. See? That's right. Boy, we've got it. We have peace. It's not something you pray for. It's not something you ask God for. You got it. It comes wrapped up in that spiritual package of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Boy, it's in there. <laughs> sure. Boy. We've got it, people. Every believer has got it. Peace, peace with God, peace with God. We're not at loggerheads with him. God isn't mad at us. We're not at enmity with him. We've got peace with God. Man, what a tremendous oomph that puts in the soul of a man or woman when he comes to that day of realizing that he's at peace with God. All those little devil things lay down then, and all those problems sort of evaporate, like happens to the dew in the morning when the sun shines on it. It just evaporates. Boy, what a tremendous reality. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, bless your heart. <laughs> Verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's what your King James says. The text reads, he's a new creation. You are a new creation with Christ in you, the hope of glory. And to the end that you're in Christ, old things, old things, old what? Former things. All those fears, those worries, those anxieties, those frustrations, all those negatives that have been built in your life by exposure to the world or to individuals, all of those things are passed away. Behold, all things are become what? New. And all things, verse 18, all things, what all things? All things new are of God who hath, past tense, reconciled, past tense, us to himself by Jesus Christ. He hath, past tense, not only made righteousness, justification, all of those available, but he hath reconciled us. That which separated man from God has been reconciled, brought together. It's like the snapping of a telephone line and the repairman going there and putting that line back together. Or like an electric line being broken and the repairman going in and reconciling it. That's this word reconcile, which literally means to bring back together that which has been severed. Boy, oh boy, that man in Christ in that new creation Old things are passed away. You don't have to be concerned about the sin you committed 25 years ago. Old things are what? You do not need to be concerned about how you treated your family in the past and all the problems you had with your wife or husband or with the kids. All things are what? It's a new day. It's a new time. It's a new moment in a man or a woman's life. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become what? New. You see, when you're born again of God's Spirit, having Christ in you, the hope of glory, that's all you're ever going to get spiritually. That's all you need. That's full deck, full house. The thing that you have to work on yourself on is to get your mind with that Spirit of Christ in you in alignment and harmony. Get the mind and the spirit in fellowship, and that's renewed mind. To renew your mind according to the revelation given in God's Word. And this is why that Romans 8, chapter 1 speaks so loudly to a man or a woman who has ears to hear. 
There is therefore, chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now. Now means what? Now. You don't need a concordance or a dictionary to know what the word means. There is therefore now. Now means when? Now. Not tomorrow, not ten years from now, not in the sweet by and by if you say your doodles often enough. No, no, no. Right now. Right now. There is no what? Condemnation. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation spiritually, and yet a man can have Christ in him, the hope of glory, and live far below par. We've seen this by the thousands across our country and the world, perhaps millions. Born again believers, but from their walk, they might as well be unbelievers because their walk does not indicate the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't indicate that Jesus Christ came that they might have life and have it more abundantly because many times you'll find a Christian just as negative, just as full of fear, just as full of anxiety, just as sick as the unbeliever. Why? There has to be a reason for every cause has an effect and every effect has a cause. The cause is that that individual who has Christ in him, he's born again, has not been taught what's available or he has not believed that it was available. That's why you have to get your mind, your mind in fellowship with the Spirit, which is the Christ in you, and that's renewed mind. The psalmist said, He maketh my feet like hinds' feet, and setteth me upon my high places. A hind is a mother deer, D-E-E-R, and the mother deer places its front feet up there and tests out the rocks on the slopes, on the hills, on the mountains. And then the mother deer places its back feet exactly where the front feet were. It's only when you domesticate animals that their back feet don't track with their front ones. He maketh my feet like hinds' feet and setteth me upon my high places. That mother deer could never climb to those high places, nor could its fawn. And by the way, the little baby deer steps its little old tootsies exactly where mama did. Mama goes up, tries it out, then the little fawn comes behind it. He maketh my feet like hinds' feet and setteth me upon my high places. There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation. Boy, that's a new day in the life of a man or a woman. And you have to get your spirit, your mind in harmony with the spirit of God in Christ in you, the hope of glory. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the what? Spirit. You know, my people, there was a time when we were blind, but now we see. There was a time when we were unsaved, but now we're saved. There was a time when we were groping and hoping, but now we know and we believe. We are no longer at the mercy of the enemy. Romans 8 17 says, And if children, then heirs. Heirs of what? God. And joint heirs with Christ. We're not at the mercy of the enemy. We are children in the wonderful household of God in his family joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and a joint heir is one who shares fully. What a fantastic reality. This day and time in which you and I are living, for us, for many of us at least, it's a new age of knowledge of what we are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 26 says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. The word infirmities in the text is singular. The infirmity that he helps us with is in the next phrase. 
for or because we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself, the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is the Christ in you, the hope of glory, the fullness of the power of God from on high, His Holy Spirit, His gift, Christ in you, and that Spirit of God in you, which is in Christ in you, that Spirit is makes intercession for you. He's making intercession for you at this moment. He's making intercession for all of His people where they're operating the principles of God's Word according to the renewed mind. He makes intercession with groanings. That word means with everything He is which cannot be expressed, uttered in words. Verse 27, He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints. He makes intercession for the saints. A saint is a born-again believer. It's not someone who has been dead for a thousand years and somebody says they ought to saint him. Jesus Christ coming in makes you a saint. You're a saint now. You're never going to be an angel, so quit worrying about it. <laughs> He's the one that makes intercession for the saints. Man, how thankful I am for that. I don't know how many times you may have thought about this, some of you older men and women, but I thought about it a thousand times in years past. I wondered why my saintly mother who was a great woman of God who passed away before I went into the ministry. If she was what I had been taught erroneously in my Christian experience, if she was already up there in heaven close to God with Jesus Christ up there, why wasn't she doing more for me down here? That's right. I thought, man, if I was up there, I'd do something for my brothers and sisters. And I knew my mother, the great woman she was. And I just knew that somehow or other, there had to be more than what I'd been taught because if I was up there in heaven, I'd work for you. If I had an interview with Jesus, I'd intercede and say, hey, send a little bit down there to Emporia. They need it down there. That's right. But then I discovered one day from God's Word and the integrity of it that the dead are dead until Christ's return. That was a release. In my heart and mind, great understanding. And then I discovered that there's something up there that's a lot better than my mother, and that's Jesus Christ. Boy! Boy, he's seated at the right hand of God, and he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Man, and he doesn't loaf on the job. He's up there pitching for you, working for you. All you need to do is get down here and work for yourself a little bit. Believe God's word. Start walking on it. Makes intercession for the saints according to what? Verse 28, and we know, no question about it, no ifs, ands, or buts, we know, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to God's purpose. The purpose is the word will, according to God's will. Ladies and gentlemen, I never willed to be upon this earth. My mother and father made that decision for me. That's right. And as far as my will was concerned, I never willed to be God's child. I just heard the word and I believed it. That's how I got to be one. Look what it says here. To them who are the what? Called. God called. I heard that call and responded to it. I heard it via the revelation of the word. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open at the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. If any man hear and open the door, you've got to open the door. You've got to believe God's word. 
you got to act, then God will act, for God has already acted in Christ Jesus. Now it's your move and mine. Then it's God's move. Boy, verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, his son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, verse 30, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also what? And whom he justified, them he also what? Glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? No one. He, verse 32, that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely, freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Shall God who justifieth, who is he that condemneth? Shall Christ who died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it's written, for thy sake were killed all the day long, were counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, nay, nay. Verse 37. In all these things we are more than what? Conquerors. And the word more than is the word super. It's bigger than superman. This is super conquerors. Super conquerors through him who loved us. Read verse 38. It's electrifying, people. For I am persuaded. And to be persuaded is not to have one iota of a doubt. To be convinced that you're convinced that you're convinced. To know that you know that you know that you know that you know. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other what? Amen. Creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our what? Lord. Nothing able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My people, the light has dawned. And it is rising to the height of its midday brilliance among us today. Why? Because he is the way. That's why this is our way. He is the truth, and this is our truth. He is the life, and this is our life. He is the light of our lives, people. He is, therefore, we are. In Genesis, he is the promised seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he is the star to rise out of Jacob. In Deuteronomy, he is the two laws, love God and love your neighbor. In Joshua, he is the captain of the Lord of hosts. In Judges, he is the covenant angel named Wonderful. In Ruth, he is the kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, he is the root and offspring of David. In Kings, he is the greater than the temple. In Chronicles, he is the king's son. In Ezra and Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder. In Esther, he is the savior of God's people. In Job, he is the daysman. In Psalms, he is the song. In Proverbs, he is the wisdom of God. In Ecclesiastes, he is the one among a thousand. In the Song of Solomon, he is the bridegroom of the bride. 
In Isaiah, he is Jacob's branch. In Jeremiah, he is our righteousness. In Lamentations, he's the unbeliever's judgment. In Ezekiel, he's the true shepherd. In Daniel, he's the stone that became the head of the corner. In Hosea, he's the latter rain. In Joel, he is God's dwelling in Zion. In Amos, he's the razor of David's tabernacle. In Obadiah, he's the deliverer on Mount Zion. In Jonah, he is our salvation. In Micah, he is the Lord of kings. In Naaman, he is the stronghold in the time of trouble. In Habakkuk, he is our joy and confidence. In Zephaniah, he is our mighty Lord. In Haggai, he is the desire of the nations. In Zechariah, he is our servant, the branch. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness. This is the Gothram, the red thread. You find him everywhere throughout the word. In Matthew, he is Jehovah's Messiah. In Mark, he is Jehovah's servant. In Luke, he is Jehovah's man. And in John, he's Jehovah's son. In Acts, he is the gift of Holy Spirit. In Romans, he's the believer's justification. In Corinthians, he's the believer's sanctification. In Galatians, he is the believer's righteousness. In Ephesians, he's the believer's heavenly standing. In Philippians, he is the believer's self-adequacy. And in Colossians, he is the believer's completeness. And in Thessalonians, he is the believer's soon glorification. In Timothy, he is the faithful men. In Titus, he's the fellow laborer. In Philemon, he's the love of a believer. In Hebrews, he is the high priest for sin. In James, he's the royal law. In Peter, he is the pastor. In John, he is as we are. In Jude, he is the beloved. And in Revelation, he is the king of kings. They're the Lord of lords. <laughs> this Jesus Christ yes who is this Jesus Christ he is the red thread that binds together the word from Genesis to Revelation he is the doom of the adversary as promised in Genesis 3 15 and accomplished in Revelation 20 verse 10 he is the no night of Revelation 22 5 of which Genesis 1 1 is night he is the light of Revelation 21, 13, of which Genesis 1, 16, and 17 is the sun and moon. He is the no more death, neither sorrow nor crying of Revelation 21, 4, of which Genesis 3, 16, and 17 is sorrow, suffering, and death. He is the no more curse of Revelation 22, 3, of which Genesis 3, 17 is the curse. He is the welcome home to paradise of Revelation 22-2, of which Genesis 3, 22-24 is the banishment of paradise. Who is this Jesus Christ? He is Abel's sacrifice, Abraham's ram. He is Isaac's well, he is Jacob's ladder. Who is this Jesus Christ? He's Judah's scepter, Moses' rod, Joshua's ram's horn, Samuel's horn of oil, David's little old slingshot, Hezekiah's sundial, Elijah's mantle, and Elisha's staff. Who is this Jesus Christ? He is Job's prayer, Isaiah's fig tree, Ezekiel's wheel, Daniel's Jerusalem window, Jonah's sea monster, and Malachi's storehouse. Who is this Jesus Christ? He's Peter's shadow, Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons. He is the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon in life's deserts. He's the pearl of great price. He is the rock for pilgrims in a weary land. He is the believer's justification. He's the believer's righteousness. He is the believer's sanctification. He's the believer's redemption. He's the believer's knowledge. He's the believer's wisdom. He is the believer's all in all in all. 
He is the believer's completely complete completeness. Who is this Jesus Christ? He is the bright and morning star, and he's my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Father. For the wonderful joy of knowing your wonderful Son, our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for the great red thread of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ that runs throughout the entire Word of God and that we find him everywhere in the Word. And I thank you tonight for the greatness of your love and mercy and grace and the greatness of that Word that sets us free. Thank you, Father in the wonderful name of our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.